My friend Dan is an avid runner. We used to log miles together, but then I got older and he got stronger. And well, that's a topic for a show on staying healthy. Well, he went on to complete an Ironman triathlon at Lake Placid, New York. Of all the Ironman events around the world, this one stands out for its community participation. The final mile of the race is run on the track of the high school stadium and the local residents pack the bleachers for the singular purpose of cheering on the finishers. They arrive early in the afternoon to celebrate the winter and they linger into the night to wait for the stragglers. Many of the runners don't reach the stadium until well after the sun has set. And Dan was one of these. He had been swimming and biking and running since 8 a.m. His legs were cramping, his feet were sore. Everything inside him wanted to quit. But then he heard the roar. Still miles from the stadium, he heard the cheers of the assembled crowd. He quickened his pace. He could see the stadium lights in the distance. Over the PA system, he heard, and from San Antonio, Texas, Dan Smith. The place erupted. People he had never seen were calling his name. Little kids were chanting, Dan, Dan, Dan. And gone was the pain. Forgotten was the weariness. He was surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses. So are you. Listen carefully, the Bible compels, and you will hear a multitude of God's children urging you on. Noah is among them. So is Mary, the mother of Jesus, the uncle you never knew. Do you hear the support of the first century martyrs? What about the Chinese house church leaders or 18th century missionaries to Africa? They are a part of the great cloud of witnesses. That's also why when these verses are understood, we celebrate Hebrews 11. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. The writer of Hebrews gives us courage for the future by examining the heroes of the past. He has just escorted us through the Faith Hall of Fame. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering. By faith, Noah built an ark. By faith, Abraham obeyed. When my children were young, we went on a road trip vacation. My daughters were ages five, three, and an infant, and we drove from San Antonio, Texas to Santa Fe, New Mexico. I told them about the time we would spend in the car, the mountains, the streams, the thin, cold air of the high country, and they tried to imagine the trip, but still, they had questions, and they had trouble understanding the idea of it. So they asked more questions. Will we get tired, get lost, be cold? I attempted to explain the trip to them, but they had no frame of reference. They gave me blank stares. So rather than give them information, I gave them a promise. I will take care of you. I will get you there. And they made a wonderful decision. They trusted me. It is the same way with the promises of God. These promises are the stitching in the spine of the Bible. Since the beginning of time, God's relationship to men has been shaped by specific requirements and promises, unchangeable decrees that define the outflow of history. One student of scripture spent a year and a half trying to tally the number of promises God made to humanity. He came up with 7,487 promises. God's promises are pine trees in the Rocky Mountains of Scripture, abundant, unbending, and perennial. Some of them are positive, the assurance of blessings. Some of them are negative, the guarantee of consequence. But all the promises are binding. God is a promise maker. As God was preparing the Israelites to face a new land, He made a promise to them that he would do wonders never before done in any nation of the world and all would see it. Notice, God did not emphasize the Israelites' strength. He emphasized his. He did not underscore their ability. He highlighted his. He equipped them for the journey by headlining his capacity to make and keep his promises. He's not victimized by moods or weather. He's faithful 
Listen to this scripture in Hebrews, a foundational promise that all the others can stand upon. Hebrews 10, 23 says, God can be trusted to keep his promise. Trust it. You can trust that if he said it, he will follow through with it. He is strong. He does not overpromise and underdeliver. He is able to and will do what he promised. So the question is not, will God keep his promises, but will we build our lives upon them? Upon what are you building? The circumstances of life or the promises of God? As you trust the unbreakable promises, you discover God's unshakable hope. As Hebrews 6 says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. Look at the key terms of the first phrase, anchor and soul. The anchor has one purpose, to steady the boat. Our anchor is set in the very throne room of God. It will never break free. The anchor is set and the rope is strong. Why? because it is beyond the reach of the devil and under the care of Christ. And since no one can take your Christ, no one can take your hope. Can death take your hope? No, because Jesus is greater than death. Can failure take your hope? No, because Jesus is greater than your sin. Can betrayal take your hope? No, because Jesus will never leave you. Dwight Moody said it this way, let a man feed for a month on the promises of God. And he will not talk about how poor he is. If you would only read from Genesis to Revelation and see all the promises made by God to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to the Jews and to the Gentiles and to all his people everywhere. If you would spend a month feeding on the precious promises of God, you wouldn't be going about complaining about how poor you are. You would lift up your head and proclaim the riches of his grace because you couldn't help doing it. I pray that you discover the hope the unshakable hope that comes from building your life on the promises of God. Let's declare this together. I will build my life on the promises of God.